Okay, so uh, I had a request to uh, further explain the predator-prey models, and so I thought I'd do a, a YouTube on this and post it up uh, this Sunday evening. And uh, to start with, uh, let's just look briefly at these equations that we started with, uh, the uh, exponential growth equation uh, for, preys and, for prey and predators, uh, where we added in terms to look at the effect of predators on prey and prey on predators. And let's leave that aside for a moment and just re remember that uh, these are equations that derive from our uh, basic fundamental uh, population growth models. And uh, go back and trust for a minute that um, the graph in gray on the left is um, what emerges from those equations. And we'll come back and talk about those equations just briefly at the end. Uh, but on the x-axis here is uh, uh, the, the victim or the prey population density. And so from the left to the right, you're moving from few prey to many prey. Uh, and these are symbolized in red and by the letter V. And that uh, we have a, a vertical line uh, in green uh, that is V hat. And that is representing a threshold value of the density of prey, so it's a number of prey, uh, it doesn't matter where you are on the predator uh, numbers, these are joint abundance diagrams, that with this many uh, prey, uh, we're saying that populations of predators are likely to grow. Uh, it's sort of an equilibrium model. And uh, so to the right of uh, that green line, uh, you have prey popula predator pop populations that will grow, and um, to the left of that line, you'll have predator populations that will shrink. On the other axis, on the y-axis, we have the density of the predators, and uh, they're uh, symbolized in green. Um, and so their abundance changes uh, up and down in this graph. But we can identify a threshold uh, level of predator density, which is uh, this red line uh, signified by p hat. And just basically thinking about that, that when there's few predators in the environment, prey populations can increase. And when there's lots of predators in the environment, prey populations decrease. And so uh, what emerges from this is this idea that you can have predator-prey cycles. And so the green arrows uh, in the center of this diagram, re diagram represent changes in uh, predator density from one time step to the next. The notice left of the green vertical line, uh, those arrows are pointed downward, suggesting that there'd be a decrease from one time step to the next uh, um, in the predator density. And that uh, to the right of that is our green line arrows pointed upward, suggesting that there'd be an increase in predator densities uh, in the next time step. Similarly, uh, below the red line, below that threshold density of predators, um, then the v victims are operating in a world that's relatively predator-free and their populations would increase, signified by the arrows moving from left to right. And above that, their densities would be decreasing, signified by the arrows that are moving from right to left. And these are just changes, uh, imagining changes in the numbers of individuals of predators and prey through time steps. And so you can put these two vectors together, the red ones and the green ones, to get the blue ones. And notice the blue ones more or less point around in a circle moving in a, a counterclockwise fashion. Uh, that if you're down the lower left, you have very few predators and very few prey. You'd expect to have an increase in the amount of uh, prey. And then you'd cross some threshold of prey density, in which case now you'd start to expect to have both increases in predators and prey. That's the lower right quadrant. And then you'd get, uh, achieve a high enough density of predators to reduce the population of uh, prey in the environment. And then you're moving um, uh, towards, say, 11 o'clock on a clock uh, in the upper right, uh, and so on and so forth all the way around. And so uh, you can, this translates into exactly what you'd expect to see in this predator-prey cycle. So imagine we're down here uh, in this lower right quadrant where both the um, predator populations and the prey populations were increasing. Well, sure enough, here you see that right here is that uh, prey population densities are starting to increase. They're above 
uh, um, uh, the mean. Uh, they're relatively large. And as a consequence, they're fueling growth in predator populations. So we expect that to be down the lower right. If you continue on to the next time step, you might be in a place where predator populations are now sufficiently large that they're exerting a lot of pressure on the prey populations. And so predator populations continue to increase, but prey populations are now decreasing. And that would be like this uh, line that I just placed over the T of predators. Continuing around that counterclockwise frame, you see in the upper left, a place where now you'd have a relatively small number of, of prey. And so predator populations are high, but decreasing. And that you have um, uh, a high uh, number of prey predators so that uh, prey populations are continuing to decrease. And so both populations are in a mode where they're decreasing. And we see that uh, right here. Uh, at the end of the time uh, arrow. And then you get down to the lower left quadrant where now you've reduced predator populations down quite severely. And as a consequence, prey populations uh, can start to increase, but predator populations have not started to increase yet. And we see that at this intersection between the prey and the predator curves. And so <clears throat> what this is just uh, reinforcing is that uh, the diagram on the left generates the predator-prey cycles that you see on the right. <laughs> and now we can go back and finish this off by looking at those equations again. And <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you to remember these equations, <clears throat> but you can see that these equations are very simple modifications of uh, those uh, initial lotka volterra equations, where the top equation is the, the change in time <clears throat> of the population size of the victims, and that's a function of the birth rate of that victim population, the preys. Uh, minus some uh, functional response uh, attribute, A, and the density of the victims and the number of predators in the environment. So we're simply controlling and cycling this population by allowing um, the population of the prey to be controlled by the population of the predators uh, on the top equation. In the bottom equation, we're saying that the predator population, dp dt, is a function of its birth rate and uh, it's uh, the rate at which it's grow, that population is growing as fueled by the prey population. So again, AV, that conversion factor and the number of victims, minus some death rate of the predators. And so this is uh, simply emerges uh, as shown by the red letters as a function of the birth and death rates of the predator population, which are now modified by the fact that the prey are what are fueling the birth and growth rate of the predator population. So it's just that simple. We take the simple exponential growth equations and you put in um, a functional response so that predators and prey are uh, growing uh, as a consequence of the other population. And you end up with this uh, beautiful predator-prey cycle in this system. And so in terms of the uh, exam, I won't ask you, as I said, to uh, uh, regurgitate this equation, but just know that it emerges from this lotka volterra equation and that um, this uh, confusing, somewhat confusing diagram on the left uh, predicts these predator-prey cycles that we see on the right that, in fact, we also see uh, in empirical studies in nature. Uh, and that's it for Sunday night, and I hope that helps. Thanks. Bye.